Hey, my name is Jim Wynn. I work at the IBM Thomas J. Watson Research Center in New York, in Yorktown Heights, New York. I have been there for over 40 years. Um, I joined IBM Research 41 and a half years ago, but was fortunate to start at the Zurich Research Lab, and uh, my wife and I had one wonderful year and a half in, in Switzerland at the beginning of my uh, post-schooling. I earned my PhD in applied physics at Harvard. My PhD advisor was Nicholas Bloombergen, who later won the Nobel Prize in uh, physics. Maybe I contributed a little bit to that. <laughs> and I've been working in laser science my entire professional career. The general atmosphere at the Watson Research Center at that point when I was started work was that Bell Labs was the best place in the world and we were number two and we were going to strive to be as good as they were. I called my group Laser Physics and Chemistry. And one of those chemists was Rangaswamy Srinivasan, a photochemist who had been with IBM Research from the early 60s. Um, he used ultraviolet light to study polymers and things like photoresist and, and do basic science, but it was in the area of photochemistry. Now the Eximer laser became commercially available, Lambda Physique in Germany, started selling one around 1978 or 79, I don't remember the exact year. But I decided as a manager that we should have that tool in our group. I told Srinivasan, I'll call it, his name is Rangaswamy Srinivasan, but his nickname is Sri. I said, Sri, look, here's this great source of light. You're using these old-fashioned mercury lamps. Let's try, try using the eczema laser. So Sri decided to, uh, he got time on the laser, and um, he and his technician, Veronica Main Banton, uh, took a, a, a polymer, I think it's a prosalate, some polymer, and to see what kind of modification might happen if they irradiated with the argon fluoride eczema laser at uh, 193 nanometers. And Sri recognized, this is very important, that it wasn't just that the surface of the polymer was changed, but he was actually photo etching it. So skin is kind of like um, a polymer. And what if we use the laser to incise skin? Would we get the same sort of beautiful photo etches that he observed in polymers? But I didn't know anything about the real dermatology of skin or the nature of how skin heals. I just knew that if the incision was really clean, your body could heal itself. And therefore, if this laser were to make a really super clean incision in skin, it might heal without any scarring. The breakthrough was the day after Thanksgiving in 1981. Sri brought his leftover Thanksgiving turkey into the lab. He turned the laser on and made a clean incision in the cartilage on the, on the turkey bone. And he showed me the clean incision that had been made with the eczema laser. Now, I already knew he etched polymers, so uh, saw that. So I said, mm, that's interesting. Do we really have a new form of surgery? Let me try to make a comparable incision with the laser that I use. In my lab, I had a frequency doubled Q-switch YAG laser. So I had green light at 532 nanometers, high short pulse, high, pe high peak power. The pulse duration was similar to the eczema laser. The peak power was, was similar. But one wavelength was green and the other one was ultraviolet at 193 nanometers. So I took this cartilage into my lab, turned on my quantum ray frequency double YAG, took out the green, measured how much power there was, and proceeded to try to make an incision in this turkey cartilage next to the beautiful groove that had been produced by Srinivasan and uh, Blum. And all I could do was burn and char it. We had based on our turkey cartilage experiments <laughs> and the concept that my skin healed without scarring, we had a, a tool, a laser, that would incise and not produce collateral damage. Now, how were we to know if it was actually going to heal without scarring? Well, we had to do experiments. So Steve Trokel came with some veal eyes and the three technician, Bodil Barron, did the irradiation and made clean incisions in the cornea of these cow eyes. Uh, Tr Steve Trokel took the cow eyes back to Columbia, did electron microscopy, beautiful clean incisions. The three of them were co-authored a paper that Trokel drafted 
and that came out in the American Journal of Ophthalmology on December 15th, 1983. And then all the ophthalmologists knew about it, and, and sort of the rest is history. Turns out that salt water, or more particularly the chloride ion in water, is a very, very strong absorber of 6.4 electron volt light. It's called electron photo detachment, or in another term, we are ionizing the chloride ion. This is a non-thermal process. The argon fluoride laser light is strongly absorbed by chloride ions. An electron is pulled off of the chloride ion, it's solvated in the water, now you've got a chlorine atom and an electron and no heat. And there's plenty of blood, and plenty of chloride, on it, chloride ions in the blood, so it stops the laser from etching. Now, if you want to incise skin to some depth, that's bad. You can't go in when, when you have blood. So we published this, and the mechanism that I described is in our publication, and then this got shelved, and I went on to other things. So about a year and a half ago, it came to us. And this, I'm not quite sure what the stimulus was, but we suddenly said, you know, there is necrotic tissue on skin, which is dry, and the laser could ablate that dry tissue like it ablates epidermis, but underneath the necrotic tissue is live, healthy tissue with salt water, with blood. So, oh my God, this is amazing. We can use the same laser, the argon fluoride laser that's used in eye surgery, to remove, and I'm going to use the word debride, because that's what the medical community calls it, to debride third-degree burns, burn eschar, in such a way that after you have removed all of the necrotic tissue and you hit the live, viable tissue underneath that has sufficient salt water, it self-terminates. It's a smart scalpel. The argon fluoride is a, an ultra-precise, ultra-fine sandpaper that is self-terminating. When it gets down to viable tissue with sufficient salt water, it will not do any more collateral damage. So I am now with Jerry Felsenstein and with three other people at IBM who are knowledgeable about this stuff. We have a new patent that has been filed by IBM, and I'm, I have two external partnerships at medical institutions, and we're trying to prove that this is the thing that's going to totally revolutionize the treatment of burns and necrotic uh, lesions of the skin. And I expect nothing less than total success.